Hello, and welcome to the Royal Academy of Engineering's Online Education and Skills Policy Seminar Series. I'm Rhys Morgan, Director of Engineering and Education at the Academy, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to remind you that today's presentation and all our webinars are being recorded. You can find Professor Bill Lucas's excellent talk from last week on the Academy's uh, website under the education pages. Today, I'm delighted to introduce my favourite sociologist. Uh, I think she's the only sociologist I know, uh, but still definitely my favourite. Uh, Professor Louise Archer, the Karl Mannerheim Professor of Sociology of Education at the Institute of Education, University College London, uh, where she is also co-chair of the Sociology Activity Group. Louise is currently the principal investigator of a number of large national projects, including the Tenure uh, um, Economic and Social Research Council funded Aspires and Aspires II study, uh, also the Enterprising Science Project and the UK principal investigator of the Youth Equity and STEM Project. Uh, previously, Louise was the lead coordinator of the ESRC's three million pound TISME research program that was the targeted initiative on science and maths education. Louise is passionate about social justice approaches to education and to the potential of, for academic research to make a real difference to education policy and practice. She'll be talking to us today about the impact of STEM interventions. Just to remind you that I'll be doing a Q&A with Louise after her presentation, so please send any questions you have through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. So, uh, fun moments or consequential experiences thinking about STEM interventions and outcomes through an equity lens. I hope they're not mutually exclusive and that consequential experiences might also be fun. Uh, to tell us more about that and answer those questions and much more, I'll now hand over to Louise. Thank you. Thanks very much, Reese. That was great. Um, so it's I'm delighted to be uh, presenting virtually today. I've got two things that are constraining me immediately. One is that I've put my back out, so if I start grimacing, it's me, not all of you. And uh, the other is that they've just started mowing the field next to me. Uh, we live next to a school field, so you may hear a loud mower going past every now and again. But if it's too, too problematic, uh, put a note in the chat and someone can tell me to talk louder or whatever. Okay, so if we can move to the next slide, thank you. So, uh, as Rhys said, we're going to talk about fun moments or consequential experiences. The context um, that I want to draw on today is informal STEM learning, so out of school um, STEM learning uh, settings, often called free choice as well. Whether they, I'm going to talk about them encompassing designed and community and everyday settings, so science centres, community coding clubs, or all of that sort of thing. As the Royal Academy of Engineering mapping shows, this is a substantial sector, uh, over 600 from the 2016 mapping, different sorts of initiatives and things. This sector does have the potential to help address inequalities in STEM participation and to support improved participation, so increased and broader. But I would say it's currently largely un or under-realized. We know that the profile of most uh, informal STEM learning remains predominantly white, male, middle class, and lots of critiques have been made of how many of these settings or set, uh, spaces can often represent dominant values, histories, and epistemologies. Uh, Noah Feinstein's even argued that some spaces almost certainly make inequities worse, talking particularly in the context of like science museums and centres. Our own survey data from the project I'm going to talk about today also shows that a lot of these settings aren't reaching even really STEM interested minoritized students. They're not being served by ISL. So how can we better support and realize the equitable potential of these settings? Next slide, please. So the work I'm going to talk about today is a four year UK US project um, that we've been doing as part of the Welcome, um, Welcome Trust NSF uh, Science, um, Science Learning Plus initiative. And our project has focused particularly on understanding youth equity uh, and STEM. We've done a range of um, forms of data collection in a range of settings, and we're specifically looking at young people aged 11 to 14 from what we're calling underserved communities. Uh, next slide, please. 
that's just a little snapshot of our very big team. I won't talk through them all, um, but you can just see we're, we're a big mixed team. Uh, next slide, please. And we also are working with eight practice partners who, again, from our cities, we're working in London and Bristol in the UK and Lansing and Portland in the States. Uh, next slide, please. Again, I'm not going to talk through this, it's just to give you a sense of this is a big project and we're doing lots of different forms of data collection. We've done surveys, we've done youth ethnography work, we've done in-depth practitioner ethnographic work, and we've been testing out ideas that we've got from all of those through what's called design-based implementation research, where we take ideas and iterate over cycles to, to get to that idea of what, what does equitable practice look like in these settings and what can it achieve. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'm just going to focus on two main ideas that we've been developing and working with in that project. And the first is a conceptual tool to help uh, out of, out of school informal science learning policy makers and practitioners adopt what we call an equity perspective or a social justice mindset. And the second is a model for thinking about what, what might youth, equitable youth outcomes be or mean in these settings. And we've got some examples from our field work. So next slide, please. So um, you can think about this in kind of three, three aspects. So the importance of how do we reflect and adopt the social justice mindset, how do we act equi equitably in these settings and what are we trying to achieve from them? And it's the reflect and achieve that I'm going to focus particularly on today. Next slide, please. So the first aspect is trying to, it's really important, we think your, your perspective, the values, the mindset you bring to practice really threads through and makes a real difference to what you do in practice and the outcomes you achieve. But what do we mean by a social justice mindset? We were quite aware that Often this, we've left this very much under articulated. So this is a piece of work we've done in this project to try and develop a, a, a practical tool that people can use to understand um, or to, to help them adopt a social justice mindset. So we call this the equity compass. Next slide, please. So the equity compass is, uh, is this. Uh, the eagle eye will note it's not, not a real compass in the sense it has more than one uh, needle. Um, or direction, but really it's, it's um, a, concept, a thinking tool to help you orientate you towards equitable or social justice practice. So the compass has eight dimensions on it, and these each have a set of reflective questions to basically help you think around these eight things which are really important for if we want to adopt a social justice mindset. So for instance, the yellow one at the top on power makes us think, well, to what extent is the practice or the program uh, that we're thinking about, to what point, to extent is it challenging the status quo? So is it reinforcing or is it disrupting or transforming ideas of science, for example, as done by white men? Um, is, has it got very traditional hierarchical relations between educators and learners? Are there very narrow and elitist ways of doing science or engineering, for instance, that are being reinforced or not? Who has agency and power here? So you can work around the dimensions and use it to orientate you to, to things that are important to think about in, if you want to adopt a social justice perspective. So for instance, whose needs um, and interests are driving the intervention or the programme? Is it in service of the pipeline or is it actually in, in the needs and interests of underserved communities? Uh, likewise, if we look at the green one, participation, is the practice being done to, for, or with underserved young people in their communities? Who's got the decision making here? How are, we, how are young people um, being valued and being treated as real meaningful partners? Uh, equally, the, the bottom one, centrality. How central and major or minor are equity issues? Are they in an organisation? Are they everyone's business? Or are they very much just a few people's? Is it funded on short-term programmes? Is it really meaningfully integrated and mainstream? So all of these dimensions are things which are important and useful to be able to think about. And the idea here is this one helps us realise what, what's useful and important, but also we can track our own um, practice. So how do we know we're moving in the right direction? The idea is, the centre of the diagram is not good and moving outwards is more equitable. So we want to, we can use it to chart 
uh, a constant outwards movement. Uh, next slide, please. So it's a reflective tool, as I said, it helps us think about these H dimensions, um, consider how equitable it is and map if we're moving outwards. And hopefully the next slide, please, will show an example of how you, for instance, can map your practice. It can give you ideas of, I'm doing okay on this one, but I need to do a bit more on that, or I'm moving in the right direction. And um, next slide, please. So just as an example, uh, if we apply it to a fairly typical uh, example of often what we see in, in this case in primary school, a visiting STEM professional uh, with a pseudonym Dr Bridges, that's not really Dr Bridges in the photo, it's just an example, Dr Bridges, Googled from the internet. Um, and this particular year four class that he, he went to see, he's doing a one-off, like a, like a sort of ambassador type approach, coming in, telling them a bit about his job. He does engineering, he likes bridges, so that's the focus of his topic, asking them what the bridges are, has a little PowerPoint about why they're important, what maintenance they're required. He tells them that arched bridges are much stronger than flat bridges, and they do a typical sort of hands-on lolly stick bridge activity as exemplified there in the photos. And they have to be on a flat bridge and an arch bridge and see how many toy cars are supported on each. It could equally be a, a marshmallows and spaghetti type experiment. If we have the next slide, please. So on the plus point, if we look at this, um, the children kind of have fun. They increase the knowledge about engineering content knowledge. They learn, uh, they, they have learned from this session that arch bridges are stronger than flat bridges. They've met a real STEM professional and it's a break from the norm. But the minus points are the children aren't that engaged or inspired. Uh, you can see a little few quotes at the bottom there. Um, it's really reproduced some of the stereotypes around uh, who an engineer is and what engineering is about. And it doesn't really build their sort of a, a sense of engineering agency in any way. So you can see there they come away thinking an engineer is a man who's good at maths and science and needs to be like strong to make stuff. And Dr. Bridges, he was obsessed with bridges. I just think he really, really loved bridges. And to be fair, he did. Uh, Dr. Bridges really does love bridges. His main passion in life is bridges. He, he did verge at one point into talking about hinges for a couple of minutes, but it's mainly bridges. Um, which is fine for Dr. Bridges, who loves bridges. But as some of the children said, it was okay, I guess, but I'm not the most massive fan of bridges. So, pluses and minuses. If we can move on to the next slide and we think about Dr. Bridges, thanks, through the, the lens of the equity compass, had he, had he had this, we might see that he's very much residing in the middle there. And if he was to redo, he could, he could use the compass to help tweak and improve his practice in a range of ways to help, to help move outwards. He isn't, it's very much being done to the children it's not really coming from, from um, any particular um, serving of their interests and needs. It's very much short term, for instance. Equity issues aren't addressed in any way. And when we've used this example with um, a range of um, ISL professionals and also with teachers as well, we can quite easily use the compass and find ways that we could tweak that same um, experience and make it move towards a more equitable one in, in a range of quite fairly simple ways. And if we move on to the next slide, thanks. Just to give you an example of what more equity orientated practice could look like, I just wanted to uh, draw on one of the partners in our, in our project, a community zoo. So just to give you a little bit of context, so obviously they're quite different to Dr Bridges, but hopefully some of the ideas can um, have relevance. So they're a small local authority run community zoo with a very strong social justice ethos. So we would we recognised in the work that a lot of what they do is very much guided by the compass dimensions. And we researched a particular one week half term youth programme with them uh, that they ran. And it was aimed at underserved young people and the practitioner who ran it in this case, we've given the pseudonym Cole. So over the course of the week, the young people did a mix of sort of classroom style activities. There's some science and maths, um, learning about habitats and adaption. They did a range of practical activities. There was lots of environmental awareness built in. And they also made lots of things. So they made like bird boxes for the enclosures, bug hotels that went up on site. They made an enrichment like feeding tubes for the ibis. Um, they did all, a, a range of things. And they also made a lot of signage and posters for the, for the visitors. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if we look at that programme, how was it equity orientated? Well, thinking about the dimension of power, coal actively and consistently challenged what we would call normative stereotypes about STEM, around who does it and who and what gets valued in it. He was very attentive to reducing hierarchies between adults and young people. He was very strong on using a kind of uh, inclusive practice. As one young woman, Lula Bell, said, he makes sure everyone gets a go. So he made sure that it wasn't only particular ways of um, engaging that got recognised. So um, there's one young man called Starr who was very good at maths and science. But when they were doing, like, for example, some maths um, activities, he would dominate, call out the correct answer. And Cole would actively manage that to ensure that that wasn't the sort of um, behaviour that got valued in a, in a respectful way. He also had very caring, respectful relationships with young people. Um, so he star who, although often his behaviour was constrained, he also was um, able to ask quite personal questions of Cole, who would answer them fully. So they talked about why Cole was vegetarian. Um, They'd ask, you know, do you have any phobias? And they'd get into quite personal conversations, even though it's only a week-long course. And at the heart, the programme was designed to enhance the young people's environmental agency and awareness. It was all about trying to get them to reflect on their lives and, what, and to enable them to make decisions about how they want to protect the environment. Another one of the dimensions is approach, and it's very much an assets-based approach by, what, by which we mean that Cole would always start with and value what the young people already knew about, what they cared about, their interests and their experiences. He, did, he started with them rather than with the science. And social justice was core, I guess, thinking about the centrality aspect of the um, compass. It was threaded through everything they did. And the staff at the, at the zoo very much talk about STEM being a vehicle for social justice work not the destination. And it was very much delivered with young people. Young people's inputs are valued. They have structures in the zoo which um, really value youth voice um, in, in a whole range of ways. The young people make objects that actually live in the zoo, which are part of it. They literally co-construct the physical space of the zoo. And that relationship is um, very much challenging traditional sort of uh, power uh, relationships about who gets valued, who, who is the zoo. Um, so it's very, very communal, communal and participatory. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the, the thinking and the mindset. So when it comes to how Cole um, acted in practice, if we have the next slide, please, um, an example of some of the equitable practices, the things he did, uh, again, were very much orientated to the aspects of the compass. He had very caring, respectful relationship. He was often um, sharing authority with them. He wasn't the sole arbiter. Uh, he wasn't uh, the, the expert in that respect. They were co-learning together. He very much recognised and valued all the young people, who they were, their interests, their experiences. He tried to shift dominant STEM discourses. And it was this co-designing aspect of young people were equally valued in the zoo. And, um, they, they were as much owners of the zoo as, as the staff. Uh, next slide, please. So what did this um, result in in practice? So in the project, we try and um, talk about different levels of outcomes. So we're interested in young people's outcomes, outcomes for practitioners, for institutions, and broader outcomes. But I'm just going to focus on youth outcomes today. If I can have the next slide, please. So we tried to separate out in the project, what did we think equitable youth outcomes were. And we wanted to focus on this particularly because there are a whole load of things that young people can get from these programmes. And so there are lots of ways of capturing all of these outcomes, but we wanted to just think, what are equitable outcomes and how would we specify those? So in a way of a foregrounding. So the outcomes we um, picked on here as youth outcomes are around STEM capital, STEM identity, STEM trajectories and STEM agency. And you can see from the descriptions um, that they're very targeted here. So the STEM capital, we'd say the equitable outcome here is that the STEM knowledge, dispositions, social contacts and behaviours of underserved youth is valued, supported and augmented. So there were some, um, a couple of middle class young people on the programme and they did gain in STEM knowledge. But when we put the equity lens on, we say, well, actually, we're not foregrounding that. We want to specifically look 
at the how the STEM capital of underserved young people is being supported. And in terms of identity, again, we're interested in those, to what extent is there a change in how the underserved young people recognize themselves and get recognized by others for being STEM people, for their science or their engineering in the program? But also to what extent are privileged young people becoming more aware of, in of inequalities through their experience? That would be an outcome for, for us that is important. Likewise, it's the STEM trajectories of underserved young people. We particularly want to collect data on and focus foreground and their agency. So to what extent do the young people's agency get supported and increase? That's across the board. We see that as an, an equitable outcome for all young people. But in particular, have they also encountered diverse and equitable representations of STEM in the experience? And do the young people feel, particularly the underserved young people, feel that they have um, a rightful place in STEM as a result? And if they do achieve that, then that for us would be an equitable outcome. Uh, next slide, please. We did also have a measure of um, sort of fun. Uh, I always feel like the fun police here. But uh, it's, it's not that enjoyable experiences are bad. We don't want people to have unenjoyable experiences. But we do think we need to be careful with the notion of fun and enjoyment. And the fun can be very much a luxury. So the, our practitioners would say, you know, for middle middle class young people, they have the luxury of fun, but there's actually, if you've got limited time and resources, and you know, all these issues of inequalities need to be addressed first. And for us, we think it's important to have what we call grounded fun, because from the sociology of fun, uh, fun entails a forgetting of the self, whereas for meaningful experiences, we want a connection with the self. So it's not so much that we uh, would value fun in and of itself, but it has to be a meaningful form of fun that's grounded in young people's identities and what matters to them. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just give a couple of examples of some youth outcomes from the programme. And it's just to introduce two of the young people, Lula Bell and Star. So Lula Bell, you can see, is a, a white working class girl. She's a high achiever. She finds science interesting, but school science is really boring. And she's been picked on there for, for doing well. And Star uh, mentioned him already. He was a uh, working class North African and Eastern European boy, high achiever, very into maths and computing, although school science, totally boring. And he wants to be a computer programmer. Next slide, please. So on the program, they had very different experiences, but in a sense, similar outcomes. Lula Bell absolutely loved everything in the program. Um, at one point, she said, oh, this is this the best day. And um, one of the young people said, yeah, the best day of the whole week. And she said, no, it's the best day I've ever had. Star has a more mixed experience. He likes and is most comfortable in the classroom sessions where he tries to dominate. He really dislikes all the rest of it. He dislikes getting muddy. He doesn't like arts and crafts. He doesn't like the teamwork. He's scared of the animals. And when he doesn't like it, he would be quite disruptive sometimes. Next slide, please. But in terms of their outcomes, Lula Bell loved everything, had a range of positive outcomes, as you might imagine, and a lot of equitable outcomes as well, increases in her STEM knowledge, skills, um, her, her STEM capital, personal confidence, and so on. She changes her carbon footprint a lot, so she has agency changes. And Star, despite disliking many of the aspects of the programme, also said, and this is when we followed them up four or five months later, he really enjoyed the programme. Um, he gave it 4.9 out of 5, even though we didn't actually have a scale to rate it on. Um, but he also had a range of positive outcomes, including knowledge. But also, he no longer hates biology. He gets over his fear of animals. He also changes um, his eco-agency. He, um, he, he changes things in his life. He turns pescatarian and so on. Think, outcomes which he relates back to the programme. But interestingly, it doesn't matter that he didn't have fun through the whole programme. His most consequential outcomes actually related to some of the aspects of the programme that have been designed uh, from the social justice mindset, but which pushed him out of his comfort zone. Uh, next slide, please. So just to sum up, we're, hopefully this has given a sense of how we feel that the social justice or equity lens or mindset is important and it can really help think through what equitable practice might be and how we might achieve more equitable outcomes from these sorts of intervention. And we would say particularly intentionally focusing on the equitable aspect means that we supercharge and foreground those parts which can best support it. So it's not that we don't value any of the other outcomes from the programme, but I think by 
by honing in on this, it's really important and can support the impact and potential for programmes for underserved young people, because I think often they're designed with a more generic audience in, in mind, which can often mean the status quo getting reinforced. So hopefully these ideas, the combination of the compass and the outcomes model can help us tailor and um, shift practice further towards supporting underserved young people. And uh, our project is ongoing. We're going to be producing um, more fleshed out versions of these models and a whole range of resources over the coming year. And I think the final slide just has our contact details on. Uh, um, there we go, if you want to know more. And I'll hand back to Reese now for the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, that was amazing. Really, really fascinating. And um, uh, just so many things fizzing around in my head right now. Um, we have around about 130, 135 people uh, on the uh, webinar. I know some arrived late, so just a reminder to those who uh, did arrive that, uh, late that we are recording this presentation and it will be uploaded onto the Academy website under the education pages uh, later on today or tomorrow. Um, please do also uh, feed in your questions through the uh, Q&A button on the bottom. Um, I want to start off uh, though, just um, the eight dimensions are really helpful and um, I was just, uh, there's so, <laughs> so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, poor old Dr Bridges, uh, he came in for a bit of a hard time there. Um, I do like the fact that you chose a white man in a hard hat from the Google images uh, to illustrate Dr Bridges, that was inspired. Um, Where did uh, I find that image? There's just so few of them. <laughs> Um, I, so, just comparing the zoo activity though to Dr. Bridges, um, the zoo acti activity didn't contain any engineering or physical sciences or things that might be uh, less um, um, accessible to, to young people perhaps. So, how could a, an activity such as Dr. Bridges um, with more typical or traditional engineering um, best be modified to uh, become, make it more equitable? I think, I think, again, I suppose we would say it starts with the, the mindset. So I think part of Dr, if we pick on Dr Bridges, part of Dr Bridges' issues come from that he's really going in there with saying, how can I get more young people into engineering? Or I want to tell them about engineering. And we would suggest that he could flip that and say, well, why, how can engineering be of interest or use to these young people? Or what do... What, does en what can engineering offer them? What do they think of need? So when we've done this with a um, range of sort of out with school practice partners and, and with teachers, often we're thinking more about, so who are the young people? Could you have done a bit of homework finding out about them more beforehand, even just talk to their teacher, find out about their local area. Yes, he's passionate about bridges, either is there a way that that can be more meaningful to those young people, or could he use a different example? He is who he is, we can't, and there's, he is still an engineer and has value and lots to offer. But again, he could have thought about the equity dimension of there are other engineers um, who are the young people he's going to, you know, showing a range of different engineers, the ways that engineering has helped answer important social needs um, and maybe find examples from that local area. That might resonate with them and I think using their ideas a lot more as well so not this sort of typical going in doing two activity but finding out what, what would that what would they want to engineer what matters to them yeah absolutely really fascinating um, and I love this idea the, the approach that you should start with with the young people's knowledge and experience and presumably that should translate also to teaching practice as well should it yes so that we're finding and the nice thing about having different projects, uh, our projects span across primary, secondary, higher education and informal, is that you see the links and actually there's a lot of common practice there. So when we've worked with teachers um, to develop the science capital teaching approach that we're now developing in primary as well, this are, there are these common ideas of starting with the young person, valuing what they bring. So the compass very much cuts across all of the work we're doing and kind of represents a distillation of all of those experiences and, and ideas. 
really great. Um, we have lots of questions coming in from uh, our viewers. So let me start off with uh, Jill Collins. Um, do you feel that some of the existing IESL activities sometimes attempt to embed career and equality, diversity and inclusion messages by stealth? Um, this, um, she suggests there's research that uh, shows that this doesn't necessarily work with girls, uh, particularly with girls and young women uh, and engineering. Uh, and does your model provide a challenge, an opportunity to challenge that? Yes, I th thank you. Um, I would say our model tries to be intentionally disruptive. Um, so I would, I'm not a fan of by stealth because I think often it's like, why, why do we want to be coy about this? Um, I think there's also a very clear need to, to foreground things intentionally because the, 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 uh, the default is not neutral. So the default position where we don't talk about inequalities is not benign and neutral. It is the reproduction of inequalities. So for me, it has to be there in challenging inequalities, raising social justice issues has to be there intentionally and foregrounded in order to be meaningful and to actually have an impact because otherwise it gets diluted down and hidden away. And, in, and whose interests is it for it to be hidden away or to be by stealth? And sometimes what we're talking about is, you know, people, white middle class people like me feeling uncomfortable talking about privilege and inequality because people like me do well out of it. So yeah, I think it does need to be not by stealth. Great, thank you. Um, Jason Wong asks, uh, with different background circumstances and inequalities, uh, where do parents' influences factor into the young people's uh, interests and career choices? Mm -hmm. Another good question, thank you. So um, our research on the Aspires project suggests that obviously home and parents is uh, a really important uh, influence on young people. So uh, when we've done our research around what we call science capital, um, obviously a large part of that can come from home, but it's not deterministic. So we know that schools and out of school settings can play a huge part as well. Um, so I think we, I think that definitely home is a part of it. And I think working with parents and valuing and, you know, using this sort of mindset approach with home can be really important. And where we've worked with teachers who have connected with home through homeworks, for example, so to take conversations back into the home to find out what people care about and know about already. Uh, that could be really powerful, but what we don't want that to be interpreted as is blaming home as a, a deficit. So it's part of the picture, but not determined. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of link questions here um, around uh, resourcing and um, uh, capacity and capability. Uh, so uh, one is around uh, how much of this can be done on a shoestring, so resourcing equity focused engagement, and the other one um, more broadly I suppose, um, uh, these approaches require time, capacity, training for researchers, practitioners. So what practical or policy steps do we need to take to enable this to be embedded more sustainably throughout uh, STEM interventions? Good questions, thank you. So I would say that all of this definitely takes time and resource. So I think there's no, uh, and I, I think, and again, having the, the axis of centrality on the compass is a definite challenge and a provocation to that idea that equity is peripheral. It's on the side, it's something that's cheap, it's, it's often a special programme, it's not everyone's business, it's not core funded in a meaningful way. And our challenge there would be that it, if it's not, we, we're just going to be reproducing inequalities. So fundamentally, for us, issues of social justice have to be moved into the mainstream business of the organisation. But that said, it doesn't all have to be incredibly costly because, for example, the Compass is talking about mindset. And in a way, working with mindset, yes, there's some time and support to allow people to, but it's not, it's not a huge, massive, mega funded, costed intervention that needs to be, but doesn't, it's not a huge piece of expensive equipment in that respect. Okay, thank you. Um, Johnny Rich asks, and this is a really good question, I think, um, uh, very often uh, after school STEM clubs and uh, those kind of interventions are with self-selecting uh, 
groups of young people. So how can the equity compass help us to ensure a more diverse cross-section of participants in the first place? Excellent, good question. I think one, one aspect is for the organisation running the intervention to think, who are we, re what are we doing, who are we reaching, and could we, should we do better? Um, so I think sometimes there can be a tendency, because as you say, you know, the, there can be a self-selecting aspect. So sometimes that's around then just doing things differently, saying, well, if our offer isn't accessible or attractive, then maybe we need to change that. It could be changing who we work with, changing the way we work and the way we do it and the reason we're doing it. And even are we the right people to be delivering it? So I think there's that aspect that that can inform. Um, and then working with who you've got in the program, it, it can help shape that too. But they are, and I, I think that notion of self-selecting can also be challenged sometimes. I know in some of our research, we've gone, uh, when we worked with the school and said, well, actually, we want to work with your middle and bottom set. And those young people said, wow, we never get anyone. You know, we're never the kids that get chosen. So there's also ways of targeting your, your offers as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, I suppose uh, the, the, the next two uh, linked questions, again, kind of follow on from that, I suppose. Um, so uh, what are the implications of your work for STEM teaching in, in schools? And uh, more um, specifically, how can this approach work with classrooms practice? Is there a danger that the enhancement of equity that happens through examples like this in the short term is lost when the children return to the classroom and have that kind of more restricted agency, you know, the, the kind of more didactic model of teaching and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think, I think from what, what we've seen, the out of school context can be really powerful and really important for providing those spaces that allow young people to engage in broader ways with STEM to, to, to get that which they, which sometimes they just can't get in school because of the restrictions on schools. So I think they are a valuable um, source there, e even thinking about some of our A-level physics students in the Aspire study. Some of them managed to keep their physics love going by doing the out of school stuff, which gave them the STEM, the sort of STEM that they wanted, or physics in that case. So I think they're valuable in that respect, but I do agree that the whole ecosystem needs to be more joined up. So a lot of our work is also working with schools and teachers across primary and secondary to embed aspects of this teaching so for example through the science capital teaching approach um how, how you get the compass to to work there and that because um our approaches there are designed to work with any curriculum again it's about the mindset so recognizing those pragmatic constraints but we've still seen teachers make huge differences um, and make big differences to to the young people's engagement and their sense of agency and feeling connected to them Thanks. Um, th a couple of questions have come in around um, the kind of different types of STEM activities. So Dr. Bridges uh, was a kind of short, focused, one-off type activity. The zoo um, was a kind of longer, in the field, less confined activity. And, and further questions around what's better, workshops or lectures in terms of equity. Um, and how can we, um, I suppose, uh, practically get the status quo to stop explaining the rationale for acting in that central zone and stopping the activity in the more disrupt uh, transform zone. Yeah, so one of the aspect, one of the dimensions on the compass is um, time. So, and, and you'll see that short term one-offs are in the center and longer term approaches are towards the outside. So one of the things I'd love to see is, although it's nice to have, it's nice to have a whole range of things, but I'd like to see the balance particularly in terms of equity engagement, shifting to the more focused longer term. So smaller, more meaningful longer term work. Because it's, we, we can't expect one-offs to have this huge transformative effect. They can spark something. But then also one of the dimensions is um, around progression. And where do we pass young people onto? So they may have a, a, you know, a meaningful, inspiring experience, but then what happens to them? How do they then progress? And there's not enough joined upness across the sector, I'd say, as a whole, in terms of us passing people between to create pathways through. But on the whole, I, I, 
I would say I'd like to see the balance of funding put more towards smaller, longer term things. And for funders to recognise the value of that, I think there's always um, that there's a common uh, desire for footfall or how many, you know, I want me to say that I've reached 20,000 young people. And actually, if it's not really doing anything in equity terms, I would question the value of that compared to putting the same money into something smaller, longer term, that's building up over time, which can, which can then be built on and expanded. Thank you. And, and um, while I'm, uh, you're just saying that around the need for more coordination, a quick plug for Engineering UK's new uh, STEM intervention platform, which will be launching in September. It's called NEON. So um, do uh, uh, viewers look out for that. It's um, uh, designed to help schools um, develop that kind of program of uh, development of young people's uh, kind of interventions with schools. So they might start off with something simple and then move on to something more challenging and, and so on and so forth. So it's a really great platform and, uh, and do look out for it. Um, one of the challenges uh, that uh, has been mentioned here um, from Sarah Carroll is the role of uh, volunteer facilitators. Um, uh, so the role that they play in challenging normative stereotypes and ideas about who scientists are and of course very often in science museums, science discovery centres you will have a very typical middle class science graduate or something like that uh, working in these places. So how do we, what practical steps do you have in training volunteers to facilitate activities that is more uh, equi 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 equitable equitably driven? <laughs> Yeah, so I think I mean some of the partners we've been working with are really strong on this, and they do very um, meaningful, intensive equity training with all of their staff as a matter of course. So it's not just for a particular group of people. They say that cuts across everyone, and um, having that time and reflective in sessions because it is hard, you know, um, to recognise, particularly if you're from a more sort of privileged community, to recognise your own privilege and you know what what you're taking for granted view of the world and things you might say or do that unintentionally repro reproduce um, inequalities. So I think that's, that is useful and important for everyone. Um, I think there's also a case for looking properly at recruitment practices and that idea, sort of getting away from that idea of, well, they, they just don't come. Um, so, but also understanding how our structures and processes can play a part in keeping people out or excluding them. Um, so I think both ways, working with who we've got, but also looking again more in more depth around how things get reproduced as they are. Yeah, really good, thank you. Um, Amy Harrison asks a, a very personal question uh, right now. The, the, the current situation we find ourselves in with COVID-19 has compounded the diverse range of existing inequalities experienced by young people. And the educational gulf is, is going to widen uh, even more. In light of this, what do you think that organizations like the Academy or funders, uh, both charitable funders, corporate funders and so on, how, what should they prioritize uh, going forward in terms of supporting and enabling equitable STEM experiences for young people? Really good point. I think that's, it is a big concern. Um, I suppose, I suppose I, my preference there would be to move away from the big set pieces, um, the big wow, this is reaching billions of people type stuff, and actually work with providers on the ground in communities and settings who are working with the young people who are going to be um, most affected by that so more in-depth work with those communities on their terms and sometimes I think that can mean not having to come in with the big vision from the big STEM organization but putting our resources in the service of others so say you know working with those community organizations who do have the, the, the meaningful relationships and contact already and saying what, what do what do you need how can we help Great, thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions uh, asking around uh, higher education, uh, actually, and whether this, um, the, the, 
have you got any experience or knowledge of equity based or social justice mindset being used in, in uh, academic undergraduate environments? Because it seems that it could be equally appropriate in this area too. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we've not worked so much um, with HE, although the Aspires project is now, um, now we're on to Aspires 3 phase. Uh, we're tracking, they're now 20, to, our cohort are now 20 to 23. So we'll be looking more at HE and, um, and the work sector in relation to that age group through that project over the next couple of years. Um, but we have used, um, shared some of our ideas with um, ITE, Initial Teacher Education, courses um, around getting the idea of you know the, the equity mindset and so science capital teaching approach working with um, uh, initial teacher education uh, you know um, pre-service teachers uh, there but that's a but I think it's a good a good point around because um, actually the the aspects around the teaching approach would equally apply to HE science and engineering yeah yeah uh, some of your Aspire students must be grandparents now, are they? Have they been, it's been going on for so long? Some are parents, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a question from Claire Gartland. Uh, I think an issue with uh, in ISL is, uh, I, I think, is really challenging, is to how to affect, uh, effectively reach wider audiences of young people, not just small groups of top students, as we touched on before. Um, as your work on the project throwing up any ideas about how to engage with whole classes of young people um, so not those who would uh, ordinarily engage so kind of touching on what we talked about earlier yeah um, I suppose the science capital teaching approach um, is an, an attempt to get to whole classes not in an out of school setting but an in school setting so we are definitely really interested in that shifting the norm shifting I mean school science remains the primary most amount of time in the primary site for most young people to get their ideas of science and engineering from. Um, so it is for us that's really important. In terms of um, working with whole classes and out of school settings, in a previous project we did um, look at that a little bit but it's still for us would need to be, um, I think there's scope for making better use of the whole class, the whole the school visit, let's say, the typical visit to somewhere. Um, and I think thinking through, you know, the compass and the outcomes could help hone those a little more. Sometimes it's an experience uh, for the sake of it, um, or sometimes loses its potential. But again, I think that idea of starting with the students and also um, what's come out on the from our primary science capital project is the idea of lensing through your most uh, through your younger service students, so actually looking at and planning the experience from their perspective, or some of our primary teachers talk about planning from the perspective of the least engaged. And when they do that, they find it works for all students, but it's particularly, it just shifts it in that way of, of what gets foregrounded and what we're trying to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Rory MacDonald, a PhD student at the University of Central Lancashire says, um, uh, it relates to engineering in particular, engineering being slightly different from the other STEM subjects in that it's not a curriculum uh, subject and so it lacks that formal experience in the classroom. So um, do you believe that informal experiences engineering are somewhat different in terms of the equity perspective compared to the other STEM subjects or does it the, the same apply? I think there are obviously um, specificities to any, to any discipline um, which are particular to it, but I think there are also some core commonalities. And I know when we've done our analyses, um, young people's views and experiences of science group most closely with engineering, closer than with technology or with maths. So I think there are common aspects in that respect. But I also think engineering suffers, we know that engineering um, is massively associated with gender in the UK. Um, and that is a huge baggage there that I think does need to be fundamentally addressed. Um, more similar to physics, but you know, if we're talking about science as a whole, but um, it's, it's got those aspects which are both common and particular, but um, do, I think, can't be ignored. We can't, I mean, Dr. Bridges, I think, didn't engage with that whatsoever. 
and we think he's being neutral, but actually what happens is by not mentioning it, it's completely reproducing it. So, so that, that's really interesting because I think um, uh, Julian Sundel uh, uh, asked this question and it kind of follows on. So as a white middle class male middle aged privileged education background professional civil engineer, he's enthusiastic about getting more young people from a wide backgrounds into engineering, but because of who he is, he feels almost uh, disqualified from being able to engage uh, with ISL, but actually uh, so he's struggling to work out how he can be involved without bringing his own cultural baggage. Yeah, and I think that, and that's, I, th I think even the, having that reflective thought is is a really good first step. I think um, what the compass does throw up and it makes us, it, it's intended to disrupt, as I said, and I think we should work with that discomfort and that's a productive tension, I think. So being aware of it is much better than not being aware of it. Um, and then once you're aware of it and can think about what you're doing, I think, so Dr. Bridges could, there's things, as I said before, there's things he could do. He can't change who he is, but he could still, um, like when, when we've workshopped this with um, teachers and, and out school professionals, you know, people always point to this um, engineer, as it, is it the woman engineer who did the shard? Um, you know, yeah. there, there are people yeah. who he can point to and flag and bring that in. And he can work on his, his own um, reflectiveness and, and what he's doing. He can tailor his own practice in a whole range of useful ways. But there's also things that he might want to say, well, I'm not best placed to be able to think of that or do that. And maybe actually I could work with another organisation and say, could I, you know, how could you use my skills anyway? Can I help you in any way? And sometimes it could be that not him driving it if he's still coming it doesn't all have to be him going into the classroom he could be supporting other people to go into the classroom um, who maybe have different knowledges but don't have the engineering aspect which he could support with really really helpful thank you um a, a pet uh, subject of mine has come up so i really have to answer this is claire molinario from the it who says many current stem engagement activities have a strong competitive focus uh, how is this received by underserved students and uh, do you have any evidence on on this i'm not a fan so i'm keen to hear your views yeah i i'm not a fan of competitions because they have the notion of winners and there being one winner and everyone else feels bad um and i think they said so i, I prefer cooperation and different i think having a whole range of different ways of classifying uh, you, you can have competitive aspects which don't just have the single prize element or, and it's what gets valued. So there's, um, for example, a paper written by colleagues um, that's just come out in, in, from colleagues from the States, talked about an engineering enterprise fair and it's a case study of young people they worked with who were part of a community um, engineering project, uh, like an after school club, and they made um, objects and inventions for social good so they were not for profit they were about making things for the community to make people's lives better so um, seats that heat um, uh, people people have to use the bus and it's very cold there in the winter automatic heating seats for bus stops um, a boot that keeps homeless people's feet warm things like that and they didn't they went to a, a fair that valued the entrepreneurial money making so the winners in that fair were people who were making things that those young people felt were kind of trivial, like cupcake businesses, which there are a million of, or a pen. And so it's what gets valued in competitions. And I think shifting the, the value set, if you're going to have a competition, can be really important to who, who can work, what gets valued, to shift the ideas of what counts in engineering. Fantastic. And, and Tariq on cap says, completely agree the world needs more collaboration, less competition. Couldn't agree more. Um, we're, we're coming up to the end of time. There's one more question uh, that I thought was quite interesting. Um, uh, do you think the students see the connection between uh, the subject learning and possible careers? And so are these kind of school careers education and these informal science learning settings, are they joined up? Do they need to be more joined up so that students see that career potential in, in the science and the engineering? I, I think um, definitely from our Aspires research um, would suggest that most most young people, but particularly those from underserved communities, 
are not getting anything like uh, the volume and the range and the quality of careers education that they might like or, or find helpful. So I think there is more there. But we're also quite, um, I always like to take a step back away from, I don't, I don't think ISL should just sell careers in STEM to young people. Um, because again, it's sort of that focus on the destination. And actually a lot of the time, what we're saying is, here's a field where, which we want it to be able to connect with the, what young people's identities and what's important to them and help them be a vehicle for them to achieve what they want to in life. And it can be that having, you know, um, being STEM literate will help you in a whole range of ways. It doesn't have to be to one career. So it's not to say that it's not helpful to show people the breadth of what's out there, but also I think we can get a little caught up in making it an end point to pull people through the pipeline. So I'd sort of soften that a bit more. Yes, you're not a big fan of the pipeline phrase, are you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Very critical of the pipeline. <laughs> Uh, talking of uh, uh, not being happy with uh, uh, words, Maxine Willett says she wishes there was another word to use other than science. It, science, it's so limiting and laden with baggage. I feel very much the same about engineering and once tried to change the name of the Royal Academy of Engineering to the Royal Academy of Pomegranates. See, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, it didn't stick though. Um, thank you so much, Louise. Uh, thank you. It's really, really interesting presentation and great Q&A. Uh, that's it from us this week. Next week we have neuroscientist Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore giving her perspective on how the developing teenage brain impacts young people's education and their career decisions as well. She'll also be giving us some uh, of her current knowledge on uh, how the current lockdown and extended stream extended screen time is impacting on young people's mental health. So please do join us again next Wednesday at the earlier time of 10 a.m. Uh, but for now, thanks once again, Louise, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.